Hello there, my fellow winged friends, and welcome to your pure and righteous weekly Primark video. This time it is part 2 from my coverage of Sanguinius. Previously we talked mostly about how the Primarch ended up on his homeworld of Baal, his early years and ascendancy to protect and rule the people there, his rediscovery by the Emperor and joining of the Ninth Legion. For today we are going to talk about Sanguinius during the Great Crusade, his relationship with Horus, but more importantly the dark secret he harbored and how it would basically screw him over later on. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Since in my first Sanguinius video I was asked about the significance of the eye and the hearts, which can be seen in many of his pictures, I have found a wiki quote which might provide some answers. On his chest was a heavy ornamental roundel carved from huge Megalodari rubies. The central jewel was cut into the shape of a heart and set on a mount of golden flames, signifying the burning spirit of the blood angels as expressed through their primarch. Atop it were four more ruby discs, each one dedicated to the four worlds from which the Ninth Legion had drawn its numbers. Terra, in the first instance, then Baal and her two moons. No mere warriors were the Primarchs. They were shrewd and canny leaders of men, under whose command the righteous might of the Space Marine Legions increased a hundredfold. So it was that the Great Crusade surged onwards as never before. New battlefronts opened up under the Primarchs' direction, and worlds were reclaimed in their thousands. Throughout it all, the Blood Angels and their Primarch Sanguinius fought at the Emperor's side, serving as honor guard to their beloved creator. Driven by a fiery temperament, the Ninth Legion swiftly earned a fearsome reputation as shock troops, which came to feed the rivalry between them and the assault-oriented World Eaters Legion. Yet in truth, the Blood Angels were never as ferocious as the World Eaters, for the wise influence of Sanguinius tempered their bloodlust. After being introduced to all of his fellow Primarchs over the long Terran decades of the Great Crusade, Sanguinius formed the closest bonds with his brothers Horus, Lehman Rus, and Jagat Khan. The Blood Angels also forged close ties in blood and battle with the Luna Wolves, the Space Wolves, and the White Scars Legions, respectively. Though he was yet in the early days of his legend, Sanguinius was thought to be the noblest of the Primarchs, and was ever deep in the Emperor's council. Even Horus, Primarch of the Luna Wolves, sensed a purity of spirit in Sanguinius, that he could never match, a oneness with their genetic father that no other Primarch could ever hope to approach. While many of his brothers fought the Great Crusade solely out of the joy of battle, Sanguinius fought it to secure the golden era of peace and prosperity, which would surely follow. His vision was the Emperor's, a hope of mankind united in peace and prosperity. Alas, it was not to be. As the Great Crusade pushed outward, and more Primarchs were rediscovered, the Emperor's time became divided pulled in more and more directions by the demands of organizing the growing Imperium. Horus, supposedly the favored son of the Emperor, was often placed in overall strategic command of the Crusade, a position in which he proved his skill of leadership time and time again. He quickly won the approval and support of many other Space Marine Legions, along with the friendship or respect of their leaders. One of the burgeoning Imperium's greatest victories occurred during the Ulanor Crusade, a vast Imperial assault on the Orc Empire of the overlord Urlak Uruk. The capital world of this empire, Ulanor Prime, the site of the final assault, lay in the Ulanor system of the Ulanor Sector, which had been under the dominion of Uruk's greenskin pocket empire. 
the Ulanor Crusade included the deployment of 100,000 Space Marines, 8 million Imperial Army forces, 100 Titans, and 600 warships of the Imperialis Armada, and their support personnel. Upon the successful conclusion of this most lauded of Imperial victories, Horus was raised by the Emperor to the rank of Imperial War Master, and given command authority over all of his fellow Primarchs and every expedition fleet of the Great Crusade. An interesting thing about Ulanor is that at the time, many of the Primarchs believed Sanguinius would have been chosen. Even Horus, I remember from one of the Horus Heresy novels, says himself that he believed Sanguinius embodied both the best of their father and the best of humanity, what with his purity, sanctity of spirit and presence, and ability to inspire love and unbroken loyalty. So even Horus initially believed it was gonna be Sanguinius promoted to War Master. Following the corruption of Horus by the Chaos Gods, after his wounding upon the plague moon of the feral world of Davin, he began to lay the seeds for his coming rebellion, to overthrow the Emperor and eventually assume the Imperial throne in his bid to rule the galaxy. In the middle of the darkness of the Horus heresy, however, the Blood Angels never wavered, but held true in the Emperor's name. When Horus fell to the temptations of the Chaos Gods and became swayed by their promises of power, he sought to persuade his own brother Primarchs to join his cause. Horus and Sanguinius had fought many campaigns together. Their relationship was so close that it had even incited jealousy among their brother Primarchs on some occasions. But in his blackened heart, Horus knew that Sanguinius would never willingly betray their father, the Emperor. And so he had formulated a master plan to either convert the Blood Angels to his cause or utterly destroy them. To this end, Horus made use of a carefully guided secret of the Blood Angels he had discovered many decades earlier when he fought alongside Sanguinius's Ninth Legion in a campaign on the world of Melchior. Horus had come upon his brother Primarch in the sunken ruins of an alien chapel, and had witnessed the unthinkable, Sanguinius murdering one of his own Astartes. Sanguinius had explained to his shocked brother the reason for his actions. All space marines are a dim reflection of the greatness of their individual Primarchs, for they are the inheritors of their gene father's genetic legacy. Unknown to the sons of Baal, there was a hidden flaw in the genetic matrix of the Blood Angel's genes aid. Within Sanguinius's own biotype was a trait that lay buried and waited to be awakened. During the Great Crusade, this strange affliction began to manifest, affecting a few of the Blood Angel's legionaries over the course of several decades. The story was always the same. A warrior of the Ninth Legion, in the throes of battle, eventually succumbed to a rage that would continue to build and build until all reason was lost. When a Blood Angel's battle brother succumbed to this affliction, his humanity would be stripped away until only his feral core remained, and all the blood craze the Startes wanted to do was kill and kill, satiating himself with blood and more blood. At the end, at the very worst of it, he lost every piece of himself, until death was a mercy. Fortunately, only a handful of Astartes had been afflicted over the course of two Terran centuries of continuous conflict. Most would perish in battle without anyone taking note of their growing insanity. But if this degeneration became noticeable, then Sanguinius himself, or the Sanguinary Guard's commander, Ascalon, would eventually be the one to end the life of the afflicted battle brother. Yet, in the closing days of the Great Crusade, the outbreaks of this affliction began to occur more often. Sanguinius was fearful that, in time, this affliction would grow to encompass every member of the Ninth Legion. The Primarch had been aware of the flaw in his genome and that of his sons for several years by this time, and had chosen to keep the truth from the Emperor and his brother Primarchs. He feared of speaking of this to any other, 
therefore to do so would diminish the legion in the eyes of his brothers and the Imperium. Even worse, if this phenomenon worsened, they might have even been censured like those other two legions we never talk about. Some of his brothers would see it as a weakness, and seek to turn it against him. He was afraid to confide even in the Emperor for the reasons I mentioned above. So, he was very determined to not see a third empty plinth erected beneath the roof of the hegemon in the Imperial Palace on Terra as the only memorial of the Ninth Legion. Sanguinius continued to search for a solution, but ultimately failed in this endeavor. Some of the angel sons had learned a measure of the truth, but only Ascalon, first Captain Ralderon, the Ninth Legion's Master Apothecary on the Legion homeworld, and a few others were fully aware of the extent of this affliction. But they were united with Sanguinius in finding a way to repair this flaw. Horus swore to his brother that he would never speak of this matter to anyone, even their father. And then he vowed that he would keep the promise for as long as Sanguinius wanted him to. The angel was touched by his brother's gesture and expressed his heartfelt gratitude. Little did they know at the time that one day, a corrupted Horus would take advantage of this knowledge and attempt to turn the blood angel's flaw against them. So pedal forward for some years, and the arch douchebag was almost certain he had found a way to sway his beloved brother's legion to his cause, and the service of chaos. In his capacity as Imperial War Master, Horus ordered Sanguinius to gather his entire legion and make for the Cygnus Cluster, a trinary star system located in the Ultima Segmentum near the Eastern Fringe. His ninth legion was to cleanse the seven worlds and fifteen moons comprising the Cygnus Cluster of supposed Xenos invaders. Then they were to release the humans settled there from these overlords, a species appropriately named the Nephilim. To further entice Sanguinius, the Warmaster informed him that he had found a means by which the Blood Angels would be able to excise the darkness from their souls, and rid themselves of the so-called flaw forever. If Sanguinius obeyed the Warmaster's command in this matter, then Horus promised him and the Blood Angels that they would find new freedom. The Blood Angels Primarch had no reason to doubt Horus, as they were as close as two brothers could be. Sanguinius relished the opportunity to once again prove the value of this bond, and so the Blood Angels gathered in its entirety and duly set course for the Cygnus Cluster unaware that they were heading into a horrible trap. And with this cheeky cliffhanger, I will be ending this episode. Of course, next time we are gonna learn a lot more about the nightmare known as the Cygnus Campaign, and how the Blood Angels eventually pulled through, but not without a lot of sacrifice. What are your thoughts on Sanguinius' dark secret? Do you think it was a good idea for him to keep it to himself? Do you think that things could have been different if he had told the Emperor? Let your opinions be known and discuss freely in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to help me keep this channel alive and healthy, please visit my Patreon page the link for which is in the video description. Thank you very much for watching, and have an awesome day. The Emperor protects.